Welcome to Veggie Happenings. We're busy admitting um, the attendees. So today we have an, an exciting um, schedule of, of um, speakers. Okay, it looks like we're done admitting people. Um, again, welcome everyone to our May Veggie Happenings. This event is sponsored by the Food Gardening Specialist Project within the UC Master Gardener Program of Sonoma County. Today we have more interesting and timely topics. We will learn about the beneficial insects, about some beneficial insects in our gardens from Jude Sharp. Ellie Samuel will show us how trellises can increase the production and beauty of our gardens. And Kitty Ritz is going to bring us up to date on interplanting in our vegetable gardens with an emphasis on the three sisters gardening. Are you harvesting strawberries from your garden yet? Our master food preserver colleagues, Sue Lovelace and Kathleen Fitzgerald Orr will demonstrate how to make strawberry freezer jam. Yum. Okay, next slide. And the next slide. Thanks. Before we start, we have a little bit of housekeeping. In the webinar, your audio and video are off. If you have questions, please use the Q&A um, to submit them. During the Q&A period at the end, our speakers will only be answering questions that we find in the Q&A. So please do not use the chat for questions. This Zoom talk is being recorded, but because your video and audio are off, you will not appear in the recorded session. The video will be available in about a week on our Sonoma County Master Gardener YouTube channel. And you can link to that from um, our website. Okay. So we are all trying to grow food with less water in our gardens. And Master Gardeners has a tremendous amount of information on our website on this very important topic. You can find it by opening our website finding the project tabs across the top and hovering your cursor over food gardening. This will display a drop down menu from which you can check, click on food gardening with less water. In addition, we have a page called food gardening resources, which contains links specific to today's presentations. You can search for food gardening resources on our website, or you can capture the QR code we will show at the end of the program if you have a QR reader on your smartphone. The QR code will take you directly to the Food Gardening Resources page. We'll have another QR code for the Master Food Preservers as well. As food gardening specialists, we provide science-based information in order to food garden sustainably. When you grow food sustainably, you nurture and protect the soil. You use compost and organic amendments to feed the soil organisms that in turn feed your plants. If you make your own compost, you are recycling organic matter. You use mulch to cover your soil, prevent weeds and conserve water. You practice minimum soil disturbance. You plant the right pl plant in the right place at the right time. You include flowers that benefit the edibles and attract beneficial insects. You also avoid using synthetic fertilizers, herbicides, and pesticides. So let's get started. First, Jude Sharp will fill us in on some of those beneficial insects that we want to attract for our gardens. Jude? Hey. Um, first of all, there are about a million insects that we know of worldwide. Only about 1% of those are harmful. That means that there are a lot of insects around that are either actually or potentially beneficial. And today we're gonna to talk about three of them. Next slide. Some common features of beneficials are that they're either pollinators, predators, or parasitoids. Next slide. Three examples are lady beetles, green lacewings, and assassin bugs. Um, most of you are familiar with lady beetles. They're the kind of poster bugs of beneficials. Uh, next slide. There are many species of lady beetles, but fortunately they have similar appearances. Um, the larvae particularly are strictly predators and are voracious. The adults, 
also are predators, but they eat pollen, nectar, and honeydew. Next slide. The eggs are spindle-shaped, as you can see in the upper photograph, and they're laid in clusters near prey. The larva resemble tiny alligators. In the lower photograph on the upper right, you see a, um, you see a, 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 a lady beetle larva. If you see this being in your garden, leave it alone and bless it because it's there to do good. Next slide. Some downsides of using lady beetles is if you, <clears throat> if you purchase them from nurseries and disperse them, they're likely to go away and stay away. And there are many weeks before they start egg laying. They have to acclimate and, um, and, and generally they disappear <clears throat> right after you release them. Another downside is that over the winter, Lady beetles often go indoors into your homes, perhaps. And while this is not hazardous, it's a nuisance. Next slide. Green lace wings, as you can see in the photograph, are really delicate looking and beautiful. Um, they're about three quarters of an inch long. They have prominent eyes and they prey on soft bodied insects and eggs. They lay their eggs near aphid colonies. Next slide. The eggs, whether they're laid singly or in small groups, always have each egg attached to a thin stalk. And that is to minimize cannibalism when the eggs um, hatch. The larva, as you can see in the, uh, in the lower photograph, is brown and white, it's about half an inch long. And this is the most beneficial stage of green lace wings because the larva are voracious feeders. They will eat and eat and eat. And you should know that, uh, that, that it's rare, but they've been known to bite humans. So treat them with respect. Next slide. The assassin bug is one half to three quarter inch long. Most of them are either brown or blackish, but some are brightly colored. They have a narrow head, round beady eyes, and, um, and are pretty impressive looking. Next slide. The eggs are oblong and dark brown with a white cap. And they, uh, they, they, they tend to be glued to plant surfaces. The adults tend not to fly. They sit in weight of prey and um, <clears throat> they attack small flying insects. Next slide. They're general predators. And what I mean by that is that they will eat anything, including other beneficials and they have been known to bite humans. So handle, if, if you encounter an assassin bug, treat it carefully because it can and will bite. Next slide. In terms of protecting beneficial insects, we want to avoid broad spectrum insecticides. We want to control ants and dust, plant ground covers and windbreaks, and grow flowering plants that bloom at different times, so that if you if if we do that, we will um, nurture plants that produce pollen and um, and um, and nectar for those adult beneficials that tend to supplement their diet with um, with, with with pollen and nectar. Okay, that's it. Thanks, Jude, for all that detailed information. Jude will answer your questions after our other topics are presented. So please include your questions in the Q&A area. Thanks. Now, Ellie Samuel will show us some creative and beautiful ways to add vertical growth to our gardens. Hi, welcome. I'm going to talk about trellises with an emphasis on trellises that are reused repurposed materials. 
if you look around your house and around your neighborhood as you're walking, especially on garbage day, you can often find old ladders. Um, you can find frames of things. You can find iron gates that people put out and think of them as something that will enhance your garden and perhaps make a trellis. Next, please. A trellis is a garden structure that allows plants to grow vertically. Plants with tendrils climb. They are genetically uh, disposed to climbing. Without the support, the plants will use other plants, sprawl on the ground, and or take over your garden. So you want to have some sort of support for melons, for beans, whole beans, for peas, for cucumbers, and other vegetables, fruit that climb. Next, please. Why use a trellis? It increases the air cir circulation and thereby it reduces fungal disease and it allows more sunlight to reach the fruits that are maturing on the vine. Next. The pollinators in your garden have easier access to the plant when it's trellised. And if you have a smaller garden, it creates more space in your garden, which is a real benefit if you want to plant crops that need cooler uh, environments because you can plant them underneath the trellis and they grow and are covered by the trellised plant and it keeps your vegetables clean. Next. Now, there are many ways to repurpose objects. And right here we have Master Garden uh, at Harvest, a uh, Master Gardener Kitty at Harvest for the Hungry, demonstrating how to make a trellis out of bamboo. Next. This is a trellis that was contrived at Bayer Farm. If you notice it has twine. Do not use string on trellises because it's not strong enough. You need, a you need twine and expect it to last two, maybe three years. Next, please. This is a trellis that's made from an old patio umbrella. If you take apart an old patio umbrella, you will find that the ribs are attached together and naturally provide trellis material. Next. Now, you can make a trellis. This one is made for cucumbers because they'll climb up this trellis and the cucumbers slide through the hardware cloth and they stay clean and it provides space underneath, as you can see, for lettuce and other cool weather crops. Next, discarded ladders. This is a ladder that my grandson didn't need on his bunk bed anymore. He was gonna to toss it and I said, no, 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 give it to me please. And up the peas will go. Next, please. This is um, something called a hog panel. And as you can see, it provides a lot of support for climbing plants. Next, old metal fences. Not only are they attractive, they are strong and you tie string to them, you tie, the plants will go right up and they're totally supported. Next. There's a grid tied with twine. Again, remember you, you're going to have to replace the twine within two to three years. Next, old gutters. These are planted with strawberry plants hung on a fence. And as you can see, the plants are thriving. Next, a homemade fence. This is now with melons and pumpkins, they're heavy and you have to provide support for them. This is an old fence 
attached to another fence and the pumpkin is hanging in a mesh bag that you get from the grocery store and it expands as the pumpkin grows and the pumpkin is off the ground and secure. Next. This garden is amazing. Um, and the trellis, the arch tre trellis you see is there to support scarlet runner beans, but all those little fences, all the boards you see up and down can support plants. And it's very good to be able to give your plants a nice place to grow. Thank you. Thanks, Ellie. That's some great inspiration there. Um, Ellie will answer questions after our other topics are presented. So be sure if you have questions for Ellie to put it in the Q&A. Next, Kitty Ritz is gonna fill us in on intergardening, interplanting in our food gardens. Kitty? Hello. So we're going to talk today about beneficial plant associations in the vegetable garden, which basically means what you can plant together for the optimal growth of the plants. So the Three Sisters Garden, also called in some areas La Milpa, is an ancient practice, but there is great new science that supports it. So it is most familiar as something that uh, early arrivals uh, Western settlers um, in the New York area learned from the Iroquois. Uh, it's also common throughout North America, Mesoamerica, and South America because all the plants involved are native to the Americas. Next. <laughs> This was a family tradition where I have memories of going to the fields with my grandpa when I was maybe five years old up in the mountains in Chiapas and planting with them. It was a whole celebration that came with a blessing. It came with a party. It came with the whole family. From the little babies to the older ones, everyone had a job. So growing a minpa, it's a privilege. This is a sustainable planting system that comes from hundreds or thousands of years of indigenous knowledge. Next. So the important part of this is that it is sustainable. It contains built-in diversity. There are at least three different plants involved. It provides a varied diet and these plants are edible at multiple stages. It preserves and promotes soil fertility. So um, it is the opposite of monocropping. It's adaptable to multiple varieties of plants. So plant par partnerships have many names. You may have heard the term companion planting, but it is a vague term used both by science and in myths, and it is based on the idea that plants like each other, they have an emotional connection, and that uh, they, they uh, uh, snuggle up together. So rather than use that rather vague term, intercropping is when you plant things together that are uh, mutually beneficial, and you can do that by planting them together at the same time, or planting them in succession over time. A polyculture is what we're really talking about today, where multiple crops are grown together. And it is the opposite of what you see around um, Sonoma County these days, where there's one crop that goes on for acres and acres, or our idea of the Midwest, acres and acres of a single crop. And plant associations are based on ecological associations that include physical, chemical, and biological associations that can improve the survival and growth of all the plants involved. So the three sisters. 
sometimes this is uh, extended to the six sisters, the seven sisters. In many cultures, there are additional plants that are added to this collective, but we're gonna talk about the original three. First of all, we have the, the relationship between the three sisters that is structural. So the first sister, the corn, keeps the second sister off the ground. So corn, then beans, beans grow up the corn, and that reduces disease and pest. The beans have a nitrogen transfer, which helps the corn. It's a heavy feeding crop. It really depletes soil, but by capturing um, nitrogen from the atmosphere, the beans make it available to the corn and the weed management. So squash and pumpkins, which are the third sister, provide a living mulch that blocks out the light, it makes the soil cooler, and it increases your bacterial population in the soil. So the tall sister, this picture of very interesting types of corn. Remember, there were hundreds and hundreds of varieties of corn available. Uh, we think mostly of the yellow corn that is fresh eating corn, but there's lots of kinds of corn. The kind that you want for this particular planting needs to be a fast growing and it needs to be relatively tall, at least six feet. It needs to be vigorous enough to support a vining crop. Corn does that. Corn is wind pollinated, so you have to plant multiple seeds close together and you need to remember only one variety so that you don't get cross pollination. In a typical small urban garden, you're only gonna plant one variety. So what kinds of corn? Well, if you like sweet corn, these are some varieties that you might like. I know that Silver Queen is very popular. If you want to try a dried or a flower corn used for drying, you might want to try the Dakota Black Popcorn or my favorite, Glass Gem. These are beautiful ears of corn that are lovely and taste great. Now for the nitrogen fixing sister. Beans are plants that have an added function of taking nitrogen and using the nodules on their roots and make it available to other plants. They also are very often used as green manure crops so that they uh, provide the function of nurturing the soil as uh, a green crop and also after decomposition. So for this nitrogen fixing situation to help other plants, they need to be close by and the roots need to remain undisturbed. So we'd already talked about minimal soil disturbance, but interplanting like this, especially with the third sister, really makes it difficult for you to get in there and mess with the roots. After you harvest, leave that bean residue and allow it to break down in place. So pole beans are what you need. Now, theoretically, it would be possible to use um, a shorter uh, pole crop um, for instead of corn and use bush beans, but why bother? So for fresh eating corns, uh, probably my favorite of the listed ones are the last two. Cherokee Trail of Tears is good, both fresh and dried. And uh, pole Romano beans, they're flat and um, it's an Italian bean that you may not have grown, but it's a wonderful crop. And dried, if you want your beans for dried use mostly, the true red cranberry is quite beautiful. And um, there are many others listed in the paper that I have given for resources that are traditional and heirloom being crops that might be a little harder to resource. Next. 
finally, the mulching sister. So you could use squash, you could use pumpkins. And by covering the soil, these big leafed crops suppress weeds and they are edible throughout the growing season. So once you know the difference between the male flower and the female flower, you can harvest those male flowers and they are a wonderful um, sort of fancy uh, vegetable that you can eat um, fresh. And you can eat your squash fresh or as a winter squash. So I'm sure you are somewhat familiar with most of these. Uh, most people really like delicata. Trombocino is a long, long uh, trumpet shaped squash and um, pumpkins. I would choose a small pumpkin. I have um, chosen for my garden this year, something called pumpkin. Jack B. Little and gourds. So if you wanted to grow gourds, but you didn't really have a place, this is a good choice. So things to consider. If you want to harvest one vegetable earlier than the others, you may have to consider how fast they grow. So if the beans growing around your corn and you wanna to get to the corn first, you might need to select bean and corn crops that have similar days to maturity. So what am I saying? On the package or on your plant stick, it will say 75 to 90 days to maturity, but some beans may mature faster than that. So try, to choose ones with similar days to maturity. Here is another thing to consider, the tidiness factor. So looking at the picture on the left, this is a familiar site. This is the beautiful vegetable garden we all strive to achieve. It's tidy, it's mulched, it's, everything looks just perfect. Now look at the picture on the right. This is a three sisters garden. You can see there's the pumpkins, you can see there's the corn, you can see there's the beans. And to some people, if you think that tidiness is the sign of success, this looks like chaos. However, these are just two different ways of approaching um, growing things. The polyculture on the right is based on excellent science. The kind of uh, growing on the left is something that's easier for the farmer, but not necessarily for the plants. Next. So when to do this? It is recommended that you direct seed corn first after the soil has warmed? Well, theoretically, sometime in the next week or so, it's supposed to get warm. Plant the beans when the core is between four and six inches tall. And plant the squash one week after the beans have sprouted. So the reason to wait for the corn to get taller is so that the beans and the squash don't get uh, overwhelming. In a raised bed, might be convenient for you to use transplants. So you can purchase your corn as transplants or hopefully you've already started it. You uh, plant the beans and the squash when the corn is planted. So once your corn gets to four to six inches, you can put other things in. So what's this gonna look like? Well, here's traditional planting method. The round dots are the corn seeds. See how they're clustered? That is so they can pollinate one another. The beans are the little squares. They are on the corners so that they can intertwine through all the corn. You'll notice that only in the very bottom left are their pumpkin seeds because the pumpkins are the most vigorous crop. You might only want one pumpkin for your whole plot. 
when you're planting, make sure that after you plant the corn seeds, you weed. Then you put four or five bean seeds in the bed. You only plant one or two squash. You can put them in opposite corners and think about the passageway. So this um, diagram shows that the pumpkins are way over in the corner. So high traffic areas, not the best place for this planting. Next. Here's another diagram, and this comes from Renee's garden, courtesy of Alice Formiga. And you can see that this is a 10 foot plot. The bright yellow are the squash. The green are corns and beans. So to the right is the detail. So in each one of those green systems, circles, there are four corn seeds and four bean seeds. And then in each one of those yellow circles, you've got three squash. This is an incredibly dense planting. So you can see that there has to be some space between the rows. Next. So the point here is that this is an ancient system that has helped cultures survive for thousands of years because it contains flexibility and it is adaptable to many different situations. So in your garden, what will work? Maybe you don't want to plant corn, but you do want to plant a tall sunflower. Perfectly fine. Maybe you want to add amaranth to your polyculture. It is also a native crop. It will bring in pollinators and add beauty. That's perfect. Whether you have a field or a single bed, interplanting based on how plants interact similar needs for the plants and similar needs for the gardeners will make your garden more sustainable. So the article, Year Round Food Garden, Growing Food with Food Gardening Specialist, Planting a Three Sisters Garden by DePestra Electra, our master gardener, um, has great references for different varieties of seeds that you can use. And so does How to Grow a Three Sisters Garden from Native Seeds. Next. And I've included a couple of YouTube videos that will give you the backstory on why this ancient system has been um, precious to many cultures over a long period of time. Thanks. Thanks, Kitty. That was amazing. Um, again, if you have questions for Kitty, please enter them in the Q&A. And now, just in time for that bounty of spring strawberries, Master Food Preservers Sue Lovelace and Kathleen Fitzgerald Orr are going to show us how to make freezer jam. The UC Master of Food Preservers mission is to keep Californians safe and well as we use culturally appropriate research-based practices to safely preserve food in our home, thus reducing food waste, increasing food security, and providing fun and engaging ways for Californians to explore healthy food. And these are some of the resources that we have for Master Food Preservers. And there's much more that you can find on our food, Master Food Preserver website. In addition, um, the resources for today's um, presentation will be there. So if you need help with food preservation, we also have an email um, information line. You can email your questions directly to the Master Food Preservers and they'll get back with you. And there's also an online information request form on our Master Food Preserver um, website. 
And there's also a phone number. You probably won't get an answer immediately, but the, the questions are referred to the Master Food Preservers and we will get back with you. Okay. Okay, I think we're ready for Sue and Kathleen. Um, as Nancy said, Sue and I are gonna be focusing today on strawberries, which are definitely in season. And I'm gonna give a little bit of strawberry cultural information. So strawberries are a member of the rose family um, and they're actually not a berry at all, but rather an akin, which is a false fruit. The strawberry is made up of many small individual fruits embedded in the fleshy scarlet receptacle. Strawberries are the only fruit that wear their seeds on the outside and the average berry has about 200 of these seeds. The brownish or whitish specks, which are considered the seeds, are the true fruits. Um, each akin surrounds a tiny seed, making it relatively high, a high fiber product. Strawberries are also an excellent source of potassium, folate, and vitamin C, of course, and they're very low in calories. Strawberries are native to temperate areas um, throughout the world. And 83% of our nation's strawberries are produced in California. Our California strawberry season extends from uh, January through November with the bulk in uh, April through June months. Florida also produces strawberries during the winter months of November through January. And we also receive strawberries from Mexico. So there's basically three different types of strawberries that are born, that are bred in, in California. They differ in growth, flowering, and their fruiting characteristics. The first type is the June berry, which is the most widely planted variety. The plants have one large crop a year. Um, the next type is everbearing. They have a more modest uh, crop, and, um, th but they can start producing as soon as there's 12 hours of sunlight a day. Um, and that may happen before or after, um, depending on your time, your zone. And um, this will continue through, through the, um, to fall. Day neutral is the third type. And that is actually an improved day neutral, um, Ever, I'm sorry, it's actually uh, improved ever-bearing strawberry. And they are not strongly influenced by the uh, day length. And um, their peak period is between uh, early June through August. Strawberry selection. You need to pick strawberries when they are ripe because they do not continue to ripen after they've harvested. Choose berries that have a bright red color, natural shine, and a fresh looking green cap. Strawberries should always be refrigerated and they should not be uh, then kept dry until you serve or you are preparing them. At that time, with the cap still on, rinse them under cool water and um, just blot them dry gently. And then remove the green cap using either a straw or just a twist and that will that will remove the cap and um, the pith. So now that it's strawberry season, there are many ways to enjoy them. Fresh from the garden, which is my favorite, preserve them for later use. You can can, you can dehydrate, make fruit leather from them. My colleague and I, uh, Ellie, we made strawberry concert last week and it's mm. amazing. And today my friend Sue is gonna demonstrate making a delicious strawberry freezer jam. You're on Sue. All righty. Hi everyone. Uh, if you like the taste of fresh fruit and uh, want something easy to make, uh, freezer jams are the jam for you. And uh, so today that's what we're going to do. But I wanted to go over uh, some of the um, 
pectins, which you will need to use uh, with freezer jam because you don't have the long cooking, right? Uh, that thickens and preserves jam with lots of sugar because sugar in jams is a preservative. And we use that a lot in our traditionally cooked jams for that purpose. So freezer jams can be made with several pectins. One pectin is uh, an instant uh, freezer uh, pectin that is just mixed with sugar, then added to fruit and mixed up like three minutes and put into jars and containers. That's really a quick uh, a jam. However, it does contain a bit of uh, preservative and a lot of people don't want preservatives. Another, you can make a freezer jam with a classic pectin. And the classic pectin is um, combined with water and boiled for a minute. And then it is um, added to the sugar and the fruit and stirred really well. And then that is put in jars or uh, freezer containers. So freezer jam is pretty easy. And uh, like I say, it's really delicious. The jam I'm going to demonstrate today is, uh, of course, the freezer jam made with Pomona Universal Pectin. And it is a calcium gelled pectin, so it does not rely on sugar um, to get thick. It relies on the calcium. Uh, in the package, there is a packet for uh, the pectin and a packet for calcium. And the calcium is combined with water and that's, uh, uh, you put it in a jar and you shake it up really good. It's like a half a teaspoon of calcium to a half a cup of water. You mix it up and you're gonna use a small amount of that later on um, in your uh, jam. And then you can use the remainder, uh, put it in the refrigerator and use it for several months. So let's get started on the uh, freezer jam with Pomona pectin. So as a little guide, when, you're, when a recipe calls for like two cups of crushed berries, you will need a pound and a half of whole fruit. And that's important because if you see two cups of crushed berries and you go to the store and buy two cups of, of uh, fruit, you're only going to get a small yield from that. So that's kind of a good guideline. Now, um, you know, when you have the whole fruit, you want to take out the stem and the green part. And I found that these hard straws that come in your, uh, you know, your drink beverage bottles are really good for poking out the stems. Uh, there is a device for that. I don't have it, but these work just fine. So then I take the whole fruit and I crush it. And I use a potato masher to crush it really well. And then I'm going to measure it into a bowl. And I, this is an important point. These little cups are dry measure. And that's what you want to measure your crushed fruit in. And um, you see the glass measuring cups? Those are primarily for measuring fluid uh, amounts. And in the case of fruit, getting the right quantity of fruit, you want to uh, measure in the dry uh, measuring cups, which we all have. So I'm going to measure out two cups of crushed berries. Now with Pomona uh, pectin, um, I can choose to add, uh, 
flavorings. I can add herbs. Um, today, I'm going to add a little bit of ginger because I like the taste of strawberry and ginger together. And it doesn't take much uh, to flavor uh, the strawberry jam, but it really does add a nice taste. So I use the little grater and some fresh peeled ginger and um, that's gonna be my flavoring in my jam today. Okay, then to this fruit, I'm going to add um, about a half a cup to a cup of sugar. And you could also add a comparable amount of, of uh, sweetener, alternative sweetener. I'm gonna add sugar today and uh, it's about a half to three fourths of a cup of sugar. Um, like I said, the, the beauty of freezer jams is you really get the good taste of the fruit. And so I don't wanna put too much uh, sugar to take away the taste of the strawberries, but it's all individual. Okay, so now for the pectin. And that can be um, a little bit tricky. So I'm using three ounces of hot water and again, a, um, oh, with pectin, I am just getting all, okay, a teaspoon and a half of the Pomona pectin. And then you wanna mix this really well. So I'm gonna use this uh, wand because uh, this pectin tends to um, coagulate really quickly. So you wanna mix it really well. Okay, let's mix really well. Then I'm going to add it to our fruit mixture. Let me get this out of the way. And again, I'm going to mix it really well with the fruit and the sugar that was already combined. And now comes uh, for the calcium water. I'm gonna mix this a little bit more thoroughly. We have our prepared calcium water and uh, it just takes uh, about a teaspoon to do its trick. This is about a teaspoon. And you mix that really well with the pectin, the fruit, the sweetener. Just really give it a good mix. I like to use the ball jars for freezing. So I'm going to put this directly in a ball jar and I'm going to fill it a half cup from the top. I have a wet towel here to wipe the rim. And then an airtight lid. Labeling is important. You want to put the name of the jam and the date that you did it and to the top of the jar or the container. It can go in the refrigerator for a couple weeks, but frozen, it can freeze, uh, be in the freezer for up to a year. So try this out. It is really delicious. And it is a very quick way to make jam. And um, you can make it in small amounts, which is uh, also an advantage. Um, check on your uh, labels to your pectin. And uh, if you don't find enough information there, go to their website. There's lots of information on their website. I wanted to show you that on the instant pectin, I'm going to put a calculator because you can use up to two thirds cup of fruit um, 
and they give you the calculations of pectin uh, for the amount you use. And that's on the instant, it's not on the Pomona. Uh, just an encouragement to look at your websites and your labels uh, for more recipes and more ideas. Okay, enjoy your strawberry freezer jam. Take care, bye-bye. Thanks, Sue and, and um, Kathleen. That was great. I want to go make some right away. It looks delicious. See, now it's time for the Q&A. So um, we're going to ask all, all the presenters to come back live here. And let's see what kind of questions we have. OK, I think this is probably a question for Kitty. And it, uh, it's from Amy, and she says, do sunflowers give off a chemical that inhibits other plants' growth? Hmm. So there is some research about not growing a sunflower with lettuce, broccoli, cabbage, and perhaps potatoes. However, um, not with any of the crops that are in the Three Sisters. Also, um, have you ever noticed that uh, the grass dies underneath a bird feeder? That is from the hulls of the sunflower. So the dried seed hull is allopathic um, to some plants. But I don't see how that would be an issue if you were trying to plant it with beans or squash. Good question. Yeah, thanks, Kitty. Um, Sue, we have a question for you. Carol would like to be reminded, what is the amount of fruit you need for two cups of crushed strawberries? Pound and a half. Yeah, so Great. there's quite a difference there. Okay. Um, does, if anyone has any more questions, please go ahead and put them in the Q&A. Otherwise, it looks like that's all the questions that we have. So this QR code will take you to the recipes and the um, pectin calculator sheet that Sue was showing us. And um, there's lots of, lots of delicious recipes and lots of information about growing and cleaning and keeping strawberries, um, as well as different ways to preserve strawberries. Thanks, Kathleen, for that. And then to access our gardening information, you wanna to go to this QR code. So we'll wait a few seconds so you can take a picture of that. There is just a ton of, of seasonal information on food gardening on our website. So the recording of today's event will be posted to our Master Gardener YouTube channel. And there you will also find prior Veggie Happenings events and a lot more. And thank you for joining us today. Nancy, we have one more question. Oh, okay. Uh, how much calcium do we mix with the water? Uh, it's one half teaspoon to one half cup of water. One half teaspoon of the packet that you get in the Pomona nectar package and then use one half cup of water. Right. So Pomona pectin is the only one that has the calcium. Um, so you would not have to do that with other kinds of pectins. No, they, uh, the other kinds, I believe, come uh, already figured in. Uh, yeah. If, you know, the calcium gelled ones come yeah. figured in. So, but I'll, always consult your recipe for yeah, the, always, exact, yeah, the exact always. ingredients yeah. that you want. Yes. Freezer jam is more forgiving than, uh, yes. than processed jam, for sure. Okay, thanks, Sue. Uh -huh. so, um, so thanks again for joining us today. And we hope to see you next month. So um, we're going to be doing food leather. So that should be another um, interesting way to use the fruit from your garden.
Thanks, everybody. Thank you.